Welcome to week one of Fish and Wildlife Policy Programs and Issues. This week, we will look at the things that shaped our current approach to managing fisheries and wildlife in the U.S. We will discuss the transition from exploitation to conservation that was led by a few visionary leaders. From a fisheries standpoint, it seems that the recognition of the need for conservation and management took a bit longer. The oceans must have seemed limitless just a century ago. Global demand and largely unregulated harvest led to the depletion of numerous fisheries stocks. We will look at the development of our awareness of limitations on fisheries stocks, and we will explore the key laws and programs that we now rely upon to ensure the management of sustainable fisheries. The first century and a half of our country's settlement was characterized by widespread over-exploitation of wildlife resources. We are all familiar with the complete elimination of millions of bison across the Great Plains, the extermination of predators, and the extinction of the passenger pigeon and several other species. Unregulated hunting led to plummeting populations of game animals. It's hard for us to imagine today, but by the mid-1900s, animals like white-tailed deer and wild turkey had been greatly reduced or even locally extirpated. Old-timers in the Ozarks say that the sighting of a white-tailed deer was so uncommon it would make the local papers. In the early 1900s, a few visionary leaders, most notably Teddy Roosevelt, began to promote the need for conservation. Roosevelt introduced his conservation doctrine, which included several key principles. The recognition of private resource ownership as a public trust, a recognition of science as a means of discharging the responsibility of resource management, a recognition of outdoor resources as integral systems, and a recognition of conservation through wise use as a public responsibility. The first bird sanctuary was established in 1903 in Pelican Island, Florida. In 1905, three more sanctuaries were proclaimed. Other wildlife and big game refuges followed in 1905 and 1908. Roosevelt believed that the renewable organic resources of wildlife, forests, ranges, and water power, quote, might last forever if they were harvested scientifically and not faster than they reproduced, unquote. Decades later, Aldo Leopold emerged as the preeminent thinker regarding the need for conservation of the land and its resources. Leopold, known as the father of wildlife management, wrote a stirring essay titled The Land Ethic. In his essay, Leopold asks readers to see that they must play a part in protecting and preserving a healthy, productive, and beautiful planet. He calls on the reader to help create an ecological conscience, a common sense of what is right and wrong when it comes to how we relate to land. Leopold recognized that the concept of a land ethic would not take hold overnight. Indeed, it remains an elusive principle even today. Now let's discuss fisheries management. There are four types of fisheries, including commercial, recreational, indigenous, and subsistence. Commercial and recreational fisheries contribute about $200 billion in sales to the U.S. economy, and entire community economies are based on the fishing industry and the many secondary businesses that support local fisheries. The management of U.S. fisheries is accomplished through the interconnected relationship between the National Marine Fisheries Service, native tribes, state, and the public. The Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act is the primary law governing marine fisheries management in the United States federal waters. The act was first enacted in 1976 and amended in 1996 and 2006. Most notably, the Magnuson-Stevens Act aided in the development of the domestic fishing industry by phasing out foreign fishing. Congress gave the Secretary of Commerce the ultimate authority and responsibility, and eight regional fishery management councils were created to advise the Secretary, develop management plans, recommend regulations, and provide a forum for public participation. The states control fishery management zones three miles off the coast, and the federal government controls from the three mile to the 200 mile mark. 
Among other things, the National Marine Fisheries Service acts on the recommendation of regional fishery managers to manage stocks. Tribes have retained fishing rights as specified in U.S. treaties. Major amendments to the Act were enacted in 1996. These amendments to the Act, popularly known as the Sustainable Fisheries Act, made important changes in federal efforts to conserve marine fishery resources. The 1996 amendments focused rebuilding overfished fisheries, protecting essential fish habitat, and reducing bycatch. The new law is groundbreaking in several respects. It mandates the use of annual catch limits and accountability measures to end overfishing, provides for widespread market-based fishery management through limited access privilege programs, and calls for increased international cooperation. Section 108 of the Act clearly specifies that fishery management plans can be designed and implemented to limit the sale of certain species of fish with the obvious pur purpose of preserving the biological species. Overexploitation of fisheries has led to a decline in the total global marine fish catch in recent years, as well as an increased percentage of overexploited fish stocks. The increased global demand for fish, a general lack of good data, and the difficulties in regulating marine fisheries present serious challenges for fisheries management professionals. In addition to the negative ecological consequences, overexploitation reduces fish production, which has widespread social and economic consequences. In spite of the worrisome global situation of marine fisheries, good progress is being made in reducing exploitation rates and restoring overexploited fish stocks and marine ecosystems through effective management actions in some areas. U.S. fisheries play an enormous role in the nation's economy. When stocks are rebuilt, they provide more economic opportunities for commercial, recreational, and subsistence fishing. Rebuilt stocks also contribute to a healthy ecosystem. To continue our progress in ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks, we must ensure solid science-based determinations of stock status and better linkages to biological, socioeconomic, and ecosystem conditions. It's also increasingly important that we better understand ecosystem and habitat factors as resilient ecosystems and habitat form the foundation for robust fisheries and fishing jobs. NOAA is investing in efforts to better understand the effects of climate change on fisheries, reduce bycatch, and focus habitat conservation resources where they can have the greatest impact. Now, I invite you to continue your learning through this week's assigned readings and by joining your classmates in the week one forum.